You've probably heard about Tutorial Hell, this infamous place where you get stuck following tutorials to get anything done. I don't think it has to be that way, and I want to discuss with you how I think you can approach learning to not get stuck and be able to tackle new challenges yourself. It's important to have solid foundations on which you can further develop your knowledge. Without strong foundations, your house will fall. The first problem newcomers to game dev are facing is programming. It's a complex task that often is an obstacle for people when trying to create games. I personally think having strong programming foundations is essential to create games. When I say programming, I talk specifically about the logic behind telling a computer what to do. I don't believe visual scripting languages are not programming, as you do the exact same work as with text-based programming, but in a different form. What is important is how you think about a problem, and what tools you use to solve it. What language you use or the syntax of the language don't really matter. With that, I also think you should get familiar with your tool. If you're using an engine, you have to know it to become proficient. Tutorials are a great way to kickstart it. They'll show you around and tell you where you can find things. To truly know your tools though, you'll have to spend time with it and experiment a lot. The third pillar of your foundations is game dev specific. To create games, you combine multiple disciplines. You might know physics very well, but do you know how to implement it in a game with power and time constraints? In game dev, we often do things because they feel or look good, not because they are realistic. Understanding the basics of game dev specific programming is super important for you to build on it. If you don't get how a character body is moving using only the provided velocity, you'll struggle every time you need to create a character. You'll struggle even more if you want to make a slightly different controller than the previous one. Reading the documentation, understanding why things are done in a certain way, is the first step. To truly understand the concepts and be able to do whatever you want, you need to experiment on your own. You don't know it, but it's the second time I'm recording this. I forgot to unmute the mic. Experiments are the most important tool. Tutorials are here to help you navigate something completely new. They give you directions and hopefully explain you why you might do something and not just how. They're like a spark starting the engine, but you have to provide the fuel. But what is the fuel? your experiments. So what is it then? It can be anything, from code to art, from minutes to hours of work, but they shouldn't be too long. Otherwise, it probably means you're either doing too much or going in the wrong direction. Experiments are focused. They're all about trying one thing. How do I move my character like a rocket? How do I change gravity in a game? What if I set my game canvas to a tiny resolution and then upscale? What would a black and white art style look like? How do I create a physics-based grappling hook? How do I animate a character without drawing more frames? All these questions lead to an experiment, a tiny focused piece of work that aims at answering a question. They're not an art piece or a full game, even though they can turn into that if you want. When starting game dev and go to more than four years ago, I started with experiments. I wanted to learn tons of stuff and I quickly realized that making only games would limit myself. This is to me the best way to work on your problem solving brain. When you see something interesting in game or in real life, you take a short time to think about it and how it could be made. You focus on experimenting with tiny things such as camera movement, shader, VFX. Experimenting, looking around the docks and playing with your tool, that sounds weird, is essential to learning new things. And a great example of that can be found in the area node in Godot. In most tutorials, you've probably heard about it as a way to detect stuff. A player entering an enemy's surrounding, a coin being picked up. Well, the node has unexpected uses. You can affect and override gravity with this area. Override the audio bus with different effects, apply reverb directly into the audio bus, affect wind. You might miss those if you never take the time to experiment with nodes, and you might end up re-implementing those things yourself even though they already exist. I believe that part of intelligence is being able to make links between things. The more experiments you make, the more you discover. Those experiences can become really useful for future experiments and games. You create links in your brain between many ideas and techniques. When you're facing a new problem, you have a whole library of experiments to help you get started. Sometimes the answer is exactly what you did in the past. Other time, it will be slightly different, but you'll be able to use your past experience and your habit of solving problems. The more you experiment, the easier it becomes. It's now part of what you can do. You know you can solve problems, and you have dozens of experiments to reassure you. If you're on Twitter, you might have seen lots of interesting things shared by PassiveStar. I think they started experimenting with Godot more since the Unity debacle, and longtime users were surprised to see how fast they were progressing, but also how they were sometimes discovering stuff that they weren't aware existed. 
It might seem crazy to think that a new user would discover stuff that longtime ones don't know about, but it makes sense when you think about it. As a new user, discovering the tool is productive. It's the only thing you have to do. You're excited about the tool, so you spend time on every aspect of it. You also bring your past experiences with you. You might be like, can I do this thing I was doing in Unity? And discover a cool and unknown feature. While you're still discovering, you're not yet limited, and thus you learn a lot. Just like a child. From what I can see online, they seem to be experimenting a lot with different ideas and tools. They seem to be curious about how things work and how they can be improved. They're not just a user of a tool, and I think that's an amazing approach. When you're able to modify or extend a tool to fit your needs, you should do it. It's another extremely good way to learn more, both about how the tools work, but also about what you need. Passive Star is not only experimenting a lot, but they're also sharing their discoveries online. It can be a way to document their findings, even if I hope they have a better system than relying on Twitter. And it's also a great way to teach others and get feedback. You might share a struggle you have with an experiment, and someone else can come to the rescue. In the end, I think you can benefit a lot by sharing what you discover or work on. And we'll come back to that. We often tell beginners to focus on making small games as opposed to big ones. The logic is sound. You need to learn a lot of stuff. It'll be easier to work on a small game, and you'll actually finish it if it's smaller. But making full games that can be played by others wastes time on stuff that you don't really need to do over and over again. Making a prototype and making it playable by others are two different things. A bunch of boring stuff has to be made, and while it's important to learn those steps, it's not going to make you a better game dev, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should never do full games. I'm saying you should not confuse making a game and trying stuff out. Experiments let you freely explore something. It doesn't have to be presentable or playable. It can be stopped much more easily than a game. It's also much smaller and focused, letting you put 100% of your energy on the thing you're trying to achieve. I think there's a time for experiments and another for making games. A good example of that is Jams. Let's say you want to participate in the next Ludum Diary. You might have an idea you want to work on, or you'll let yourself be inspired or not by the theme. This is the make a game part. In preparation to the jam, you'd like to explore a different art style or post-processing effect. This is the experiment part. You'll take a short moment, maybe an hour or two, to fill around in your engine of choice to set up a project with this art style. The end goal of such an experiment might be to decide if it will be easier or faster to create a game with it. This means that the end result might be it doesn't work, and you'll revert to a style you're used to. I took the example of a jam because experimenting while being pressured by time can be extremely difficult. Depending on what you want out of the jam, you might not have time to try things. You'll go with what you know and focus on polishing everything. That's why taking the time to experiment with stuff before the jam is interesting. It's like training before the race day. Another aspect is the freedom coming from experimenting. When making a game, you might be restricted by the idea of what a game is. As I've said earlier, experiments don't need to be playable or finished. Their scope is much smaller. They might actually don't even work, and that can be the point. Sometimes you have a specific idea, and you want to try it. You make the experiment and see if it works or not. In that regard, experiments are like prototypes. They're used to assess the feasibility of something. I prefer to use the word experiment, as I think it encompasses is more stuff than what people might think of with prototype. I made the comparison with jams, but it's even more obvious with commercial games. When you make a game for it to be sold, you have so many more constraints that you can easily crush your experiment brain. You might try to reduce the risk and thus avoid experimenting too much to not lose time and money. You might argue that this is the difference between the prototype and the production phase. I kind of agree, but still, I think you'll limit yourself much more if you're prototyping with the idea of making a commercial game than if you're just freely experimenting. One last important aspect of an experiment is you don't feel guilty about doing it or failing it. I don't think I'm the only one feeling like this, at least I hope so. When I'm working on a game, I try to be as productive as possible, and I can't help but feeling bad about trying stuff out that might not work. I know it's unreasonable to think we can always be 100% productive, but I'm working on it. That's part of why I went with the simple neon art style with color space. It's something I know, something I've done already with Dashbong, and I know I won't have to fiddle around too much to be productive. The problem with thinking like this is you'll never allow yourself to try different things and thus become better. When doing an experiment, you put a name on something. You define borders around this nebulous idea of trying stuff out. You set a hard limit on experimentation. With that, you remove the guilt of not being productive. On the contrary, you might even feel productive because you're learning, making choices, and making it easier for yourself in the future. 
Keeping track of your experiments is crucial to make sure you can review them later if needed. That's why I personally started a GitHub repo to publish my experiments. Other people might find them useful and future me will be very happy to grab some code from this repo. I think you should make your repo public as it can be useful to others. And if you're not comfortable showing your code, let's face it, no one cares. That being said, you can always just make it private. But I insist. Keep track of your findings. You don't have to write a full-on article for each one, but maybe just a small description and eventually a problem you faced or something interesting you found. It's like building your own personal knowledge base. Speaking of knowledge base, if you want to keep track of everything in one place, I would suggest you use a strong note-taking system. I personally use Notion, but I know Obsidian is another good option, and I'm sure you can find tons of other interesting tools for that. I would strongly advise against using paper, though, simply because it's harder to edit, and you can't just do Control f and search for a keyword. But you do you. Keeping track is also important to be able to look at what you've done. When you're not making games, it's easy to look back at the past year and think you've done nothing. If you have a nice repo or a list with all of your experiments, you can actually see the progress. Don't underestimate this aspect. A healthy and happy mind is essential for everything. Experiments are tied to the idea of unstructured learning, and I'm a firm believer in that. I personally learn a lot by fully diving into a subject and gathering things from here and there, and then trying to explore the different ideas on my own. I think it doesn't have to be the only way though. There's a place for structured learning, and it also depends on your personality or even on the period. Sometimes you want to be guided to avoid making mistakes that could eventually kill you. Having structure might also help to make learning easier with a precise idea of what you're going to learn and in what order. I also believe you might prefer one type of learning or the other depending on the subject or the moment in your life. You might be tempted to experiment more with something you're truly attracted to and if you want to commit a lot of time to it. The important thing is to make sure you progress the way you want in your learning. If you're stagnating or struggling to learn, you need to look at what you're doing and understand what to change. There's no one true magical solution for everyone. We are all different, so we have to adapt our learning. Tutorials can still be useful, but you need to be mindful on how to use them. The first thing is to choose the tutorials you'll follow. Ideally, you want them to tell you why they do things the way they do and eventually discuss quickly the other solutions and why they decided to not use them. This is important, as you might otherwise think the presented solution is the only one and you might miss something that would be more suited for you. Keep in mind that tutorials usually show one way of doing something when there are many other ways. The second idea to make the most out of tutorials is to not finish them. I'm not joking, let me explain. I used to look at the beginning of tutorials, when the teacher would explain how they were going to tackle the problem. Then, I would try to implement it on my own. Each time you do that, you try to think of your own solution before even seeking help online. After some time, you can do everything on your own, because your problem-solving brain is strong enough. It doesn't mean you should reinvent the wheel all the time though. Sometimes, you just want an already built solution, and it's fine. Sometimes you learn, sometimes you copy, sometimes you take, sometimes you create. But don't forget to give. Let's take the example of the grappling hook. You don't know how to get started, so you pick a tutorial, and in the beginning, you hear this. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make a grappling hook with God of War. We'll use a pin joint to attach a rigid body player to surfaces. And you stop here. You have the idea, and you now need to figure out the implementation. As you work through your implementation, you can of course come back to the tutorial to help you if you're getting stuck. Forcing yourself to think about the implementation is going to help you a lot when learning something new. It might be very unpleasing, you'll probably struggle and get stuck, but this is part of the learning process. You're supposed to struggle sometimes. It's totally normal. I'm talking specifically about tutorials here, they usually don't have the time to go in details about everything. Courses, on the other end, can be more about giving knowledge, but also explaining why, giving context and more. Tutorials are often created to be consumed, and for that, they need to be easily digestible, even if they don't teach things the best way possible. Because you're usually paying for courses, you might be more committed, which in return allows them to go more in depth. This doesn't mean all courses are great. You still have to be selective and hope that they won't be just a recipe, but also explain you why they do things the way they do. A course should aim at making you independent. The best course possible will be created so you don't need it anymore after finishing it. And speaking of great courses, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Game development is a creative and technical field with a lot of complexity, and many talented people can be scared, especially of the coding aspect. But Brilliant is here to help with a range of fascinating courses that can help you 
in your learning journey, from math to computer science, with thousands of lessons available and new ones added every month, you'll have access to all the knowledge and resources you need. The bite-sized lessons, storytelling, and interactivity make it the best way to learn complex topics, such as computer science. The curated course Programming with Python guides you with learning one of the most in-demand programming language, from knowing nothing to coding fundamentals. It will guide you from curiosity to mastery through interactive challenges and problems to solve. Start learning and improving your skills today with Brilliant by visiting brilliant.org slash Mr. Elliptich or click the link in the description to get a 30-day trial for free. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, we talked about a lot of things, so let's recap. What are the important things to escape tutorial hell? Work on your foundations first. Make sure you have a good understanding of programming. Get to know your tool like your engine and then work on game dev specific skills. Experiment a lot. Try different things, explore ideas, don't limit yourself. Choose small experiments to make sure you can fail easily. Focus on specific ideas so you can put 100% of your energy on that thing. By accumulating experiments, you create more experience and this will come in very handy when you'll work on future games. Keep track of your experiments so you can go back to your findings and also have a sense of accomplishment. You can still do game jams from time to time, of course. In the end, you have to enjoy what you're doing. Use tutorials mindfully. Use them if you're stuck on something don't necessarily complete them. Use them as a starting point to get the idea on how to approach a problem, but try to implement your own solution. Sometimes you don't really care about finding your own solution and you want something that works. You don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. There's a time for learning and another for producing. And with that, you'll hopefully escape tutorial hell. Good luck. I hope you enjoyed this video and I really want to know what you think, so please share down below in the comments. I truly hope this video can be useful for you and maybe help you escaping tutorial hell. I will see you in the next video. In the meantime, Time. Have a great day. Bye. I hope this time I didn't forget the mute button.